We are the weirdos, mister. Black as night, erase death from our sight. White as light, mighty hectic, make it right. I myself am strange and unusual. Cast a circle, spark some incense, and grab a cup of tea, because it's time for the Cousins Coven podcast. I'm Sharon. And this is Wendy. Welcome back to the Coven, you guys. Yay! Welcome back to the podcast. Yay! We're super excited today. We're supposed to be doing a different episode this week. We were going to be doing the Planes of Existence, but we decided that we found a topic uh, that we were really passionate about the spiritualism movement. Yes. And so we decided we were going to do a two part episode on the spiritualism movement. And today is part one. We're really excited about this. But before we get into all of that, we did have a listener question and kind of some good vibes from a listener crash. And we were super excited to get this. And he said, or they say, Hey guys, I just wanted to reach out and say hi. I have recently started listening to your podcast and love it. I'm pretty new into the whole witchy vibe thing, but always been into the paranormal conspiracy theory stuff. So it's awesome how you touch on both of these things in your podcast. Thank you so much for saying that. I know. Um, I'm like always worried our our weird vibes are just too much. (laughs) (laughs) Right, right. Because we do go back and forth between so many different topics. We do. So yay. It's great. Yay. And uh, they say, I've pretty much been binge listening to your show here lately. So thanks for all the entertainment and information. I've got a couple of questions, too, if you guys wouldn't mind giving me some suggestions. As a guy, I've been somewhat hesitant about talking to my to many people about any of this or reaching out to anybody for advice. So I guess we're going to answer the questions that he has So the first question was, I was wondering about how you guys go about casting a circle. So Sharon, do you want to take that answer? Sure. And I just have to backtrack too and just how you're saying you're somewhat hesitant to talking about people about all of this, as you've heard us talk about on podcasts before, we can so relate to that. Yes, And you are not alone. So thank you so much for reaching out. This email gave me life. I loved it so much. Um, yes. And so for your lots of inspiration too. Yes, I love your question. So for how I go about casting a circle, um, like I've mentioned plenty of times before, my magic stemmed from like Wiccan techniques, and so I would just visualize um, energy. And there's like three types of really energy you can work with. Well, probably more than three, but here's three I'll give you. You can work with the earth energy, pulling up from the earth, that power, and imagine it filling you up with white light and then just radiating out with your hands. So that's how I would start, was working with earth energy. And I would just use my hand with no tools, just being brand new, waving it around in one slow circle. And as I do that very slowly and thoughtfully, I would I would project my magical power and energy which at the time, I think when I started, I would always imagine it as like wispy purple casting me in a circle. And it's not just so basic as like a flat circle. It's more like an egg shape. So it goes below the earth and encompasses me. It goes above me and encompasses me in this little like oval shape, I would say. And when you're thinking about your circle, you just want to give some protection energy and power and let it be there to keep all of your energy in and all of that bad energy out. And that's kind of how I started. Nice. And so the next question is, what sort of spells might be a good place to start out on? I was thinking protection, protection spells. That's a good uh, what, good one. Yeah. Yeah. What were you thinking? I would say, what are you drawn towards? And lean into that. Are you someone who likes to work with elements? Maybe do some element magic? Are you someone who likes candles? Do some candle magic? Um, But I think protection is actually a really good idea because that's universally a good thing. And if you're new and there's a lot of different aspects of magic to work with, I think protection would be a great place to start. You can't mess that up. Right. (laughs) Exactly. And you can protect your space that you're living in. You can protect the space that you work in. Mm -hmm. Um, And not just your witchy workspace, but your actual going 
to your job workspace. So I know for me, like in my job, I have a lot of negativity um, that comes from patrons who come into the office. And so I actually have protection amulets is what I call them. It's basically just bracelets and necklaces that I've done protection spells on and then wear them so that maybe the negativity doesn't attach itself to me. Mm-hmm. So it's always a good a good thing to to have protection. Yeah, maybe it'll just work on cleansing your personal area, cleaning it, mm-hmm. and protecting it. Yes. So the next question is, I was also wondering about masculine energies and deities and how best to work with those. I really like this question because a lot of people always think of witches as female and, and only working with goddess. And that's right. a really big misconception, I could say, for, for Wiccan's perspective. It is about that balance of god and goddess, male and female. And I'm the kind of person who likes to do both. And you can always do just the god or just the goddess. Obviously, we're all very different. Um, and so when I first started out, I guess... In my practices, I wasn't quite ready to pick a god. And sometimes they can feel kind of disingenuous if we just go and pick one. You know, you kind of want to be Mm -hmm. the right moment. And a lot of synchronicities will usually lead you to it. You might stumble across them in a book or something like that. But when you find the right god or they find you, you'll kind of know and just start working with them. So give yourself time. If it takes time, that's okay. But what I'm trying to say is you can kind of boil it down to be more basic and just have the god be represented in, in... even just the nature and the sun um, with the, I was always working with like the horn god, Cernanos and Pan and those Wiccan deities. And so I think of the god as someone who's very much in control of the forests and with nature. And it sounds like you're kind of an outdoorsy person. So that might be a good place to start is like just working outside, I guess. I'm kind of yes. segueing into the next yeah. question a little bit here. <laughs> yes, that's Okay. So the next question was, I've always been very into nature and outdoorsy. So that is where I spend most of my time trying to reach out into the universe. And I'm always, or I'm also a newly homeowner. So I have, I have the ability to do some landscaping and start a garden. Which is awesome. Yeah, which is pretty amazing. I think it would be really cool to have a magical outdoor space. Yes. That's. That's always amazing where you can incorporate rocks and stones and um, maybe even have like a rock garden. Yeah. And then you- that's like a bucket list to have outdoor altar space for me. <laughs> so I'm so right? excited on your behalf to have a garden. That's really neat. Yes. I think that's a great place to start in connecting with nature and really connecting with the energy of the universe and maybe just, you know, getting a little fire going outside and looking up at the stars mm-hmm. if you're not in a too big of a city where you can't see stars. And you could burn your affirmations and intentions in the flames. Like there's just so many things you can do outside to connect with gods in the universe. So it sounds like you have a lot at your disposal. So this is super exciting. Yes, very exciting. Um And then he says, I've been interested in trying to grow my own herbs and plants, but also interested in the Fey realm. So any info would be appreciated. Mm. So that would be cool, too. So if you do have this decent backyard, then you could have a space to have like an altar, like Sharon was saying, to have a space where you could burn things, but also maybe incorporate all elements. So earth, air, fire, water. So if you're doing earth then you could have that little garden area to grow the specialty herbs. And the fey realm, you could have like a fey circle. Yes, a fairy circle or a fairy garden. Yeah, yeah. And so that would be really cool to incorporate. So what if you did all those elements Yes. And mixed them into one backyard. Nobody says you have to do just one thing. Why can't you do it all? <laughs> I would look into fairy houses and fairy gardens if see if that's something yeah. you'd be interested in. But it is said that like Fay love like little houses to go stay in. So I've made like a little like almost like a birdhouse and I left it outside mm-hmm. and put like a little shiny thimble and a bell on it because they're said to love shiny things and you can leave offerings mm-hmm. for the fae and this is something you can really do in your garden leave offerings for the god whatever you want to work with for the fae and you can put little berries by the houses and you know whatever grabs it if it's a raccoon whatever that's cool that's how offerings work you put it out there with the intention and whatever it takes it takes it but like fairies do love berry little offerings so you could really mm-hmm. do some fae work 
Right. And lights. Mm. Maybe you can incorporate some sort of, yeah, some sort of solar lights that don't really use a lot of energy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a magical garden. When you get that set up, we would love some pictures or updates. (laughs) Absolutely. And much luck to you and love to you for giving us such kind words too. Yes. Thank you. Yes, thanks for the encouragement, and we hope that you enjoyed some of our answers. Good luck with that garden. Yes. All right. So we're moving on, if that's all right. Yes. We're going to talk about the spiritualism movement. Yes. So this is something, like we mentioned, we both got really into. I could just see us being spiritualists, and this is just an amazing movement that really captivated both of our imaginations. Right. Just a springboard for a lot of uh, a lot of what we we use in our daily lives. They they talked about back then. Yeah, a lot of this paranormal stuff. It seems to really have gained traction here at the spiritual movement. It said that spiritualism is the belief that the soul is eternal with life after death, and it's the belief that the departed are actually willing and able to to communicate with the living. So it was this whole movement that really started thinking about what happens after death and is there life after death? Um, I've read in a book, this interesting quote that the basic premise behind spiritualism is simple. No one really leaves when they die and death is simply a change of state. If the living are a melting ice cube, the dead are just the water as such. The deceased can be refrozen for a time to interact with the living, whether it be for a comforting chat, a bit of advice, or even just as a fun trick at parties. (laughs) That's so fun. (laughs) Right? That's great. So looking into the time period of spiritualism, this was from the middle of the 19th century to around the 1930s, where spiritualism was a worldwide movement. And they say that this is no coincidence that this was between the end of the Civil War and World War I. There was a high mortality death rate going on. People were losing their loved ones. And with the war and also with these widespread illnesses, a lot of people were losing their young children and family members. And so there was this desire to communicate with their loved ones who had passed on. And they do say that in spite of all of the war and the tragedy, that people really had high hopes for change. This was around the time of the suffrage movement, women getting more rights. This was the time of like abolition of the slavery and seances were huge and they just started happening everywhere. Um, It was even kind of getting involved with the science community. I had read that Edison and Nikola Tesla were both searching for this electrical frequency to create a ghost machine for communication. So people, some people were really taking it seriously. And um, with seances, they would have mediums. And this was really considered to be a female job. And this job, there was a high demand for it. And so women, for the first time, were really getting interesting jobs where they were able to make a name for themselves, climb the society ladders, make their own income and be very independent and empowered. So this seems just really awesome. These women were empowered by talking to ghosts and doing ghost things. So of course, our our interests were super piqued by this. Yeah, we're like, whoop, whoop. (laughs) Yeah, I was like, oh, we would so be doing that. (laughs) Women were able to travel and, like I said, support themselves. There was plenty of haters on the spiritualist movement. Um, A lot of religious people were opposed to it. They said that mediums lacked virtue. And then there were a lot of skeptics who were coming out and saying that this was all just a lie. They were trying to discredit these so-called psychics and mediums and frauds and expose them for what they were and just kind of outing all the hoaxers. So there was a lot going on and a lot of different types of mediums and a lot of different types of seances. But I really wanted to just take us back to the beginning of the spiritualist movement and talk to you guys about the Fox sisters. So when I first heard about the Fox sisters, I was like, Oh my God, this sounds like a cute Disney movie. Like they're this cute sister mediums and like what a fairy tale. And I did get a fairy tale, but this is more of like a Grimm's fairy tale. (laughs) It's a little darker and creepy or just sinister, I would say, but it is the start of the spiritualist movement. And this happened in Hydesville, New York, December of 1848, in the home of John Fox and wife Margaret Fox. They had their two younger daughters living with them at that time, the 14-year-old Margareta, which we call Maggie, and their 12-year-old Kate. And this all started with one night, the house was just full of noises. They were hearing these raps and these knocks. And Mr. Fox was trying to find the source of this noise, and he could not ever figure out where it was coming from. 
and this knocking noise kind of kept increasing. And on March 30th, which was April Fool's Eve, the family was disturbed all night. And they just kind of concluded, well, it must be some restless, unhappy spirit making all these noises. And the family ended up telling their older son, David, who lived on the farm nearby, he was like, we've been having these weird spirits knocking and we can't figure it out. We're going to go public and try to see if people can help us. And he was like, no, you need to just keep it to yourselves. Don't go public with this. There's a logical explanation. We're going to figure this out. Just keep it in the family. We don't want to be weirdos, okay? We can't expose our family like that, that we're thinking we're talking to ghosts. Right. So the next night, the activity really continued. And this time, Kate decided to talk to it. So she began to snap her fingers twice and said, here, Mr. Splitfoot, do as I do. Splitfoot was kind of like the devil because he had those like cloved horns. Mm -hmm. So Maggie joined in and she decided to do clapping. So she clapped four times asking the spirit to knock back and they got four knocks back. So Mrs. Fox was getting really shaken and she was kind of intrigued. And so she joined in and she was asking the noise to knock 10 times and it knocked back 10 times. So they're at this point, they're like, you know what? This is, is an intelligent thing knocking back to us. This is incredible. So then Miss Fox asked, like, how old is my daughter, Margaret? And then the little thing made 14 knocks. How old is Kate? And they got 12 raps back. And so these questions evolved to yes, no questions to figure out who the spirit was. And the knocks were responding to every question pretty intelligibly, and pretty quickly. And they had deduced that the spirit who had died um, was possibly the age of 33, a peddler with a family of five kids who had been murdered in the home and buried in the basement. And I believe that they were using the alphabet and getting like one knock for A, two for B. Like they, they kind of had a system to get all this information. And so Miss Fox then asked, will you answer my questions in front of our neighbors? Like they really just wanted to prove this weird shit was going on to other people, despite what their son had told them. And the knock answered yes. And so they pull in their neighbors who were really amazed at the spirit communication and taken back by it. And like everyone just started gossiping about this and it spread like crazy. And the house ended up becoming packed with spectators. Like everyone was traveling to come check this out. So there would be crowds gathered in the basement and they would ask the spirit to knock where was the burial place. And so like the knocking would try to lead them to where the body was buried in the basement. And this goes on. And so in April, there was this attorney named E.E. E. Lewis. He got involved and he started taking sworn depositions from like every adult involved and witness. And it ended up getting printed into a pamphlet about his investigation. He had a printer who was up in Rochester, New York, and he decided to get the pamphlet finally printed when he was all done with it. And the printer knew someone who knew the fox's oldest daughter, Leah. So through the grapevine, it travels to her that there's this pamphlet coming out. And he gave her one of these pamphlets. And Leah was just living up in Rochester where she had a daughter in life of her own with like very small means of living and, you know, no really social standing. And Leah wasn't aware of anything that was going on back at her home. So she read all these claims and it said that she cried and then just rushed back to her family home to go talk to him about this and what was going on and try to figure it out. When she finally gets to talk to her little sisters alone, away from her parents, Maggie and Kate admitted to her the truth of the knockings. The truth is that they had perfected the art of cracking their toes. They could do this undetected, even with their shoes on. Gross. <laughs> <laughs> even with their shoes on they could make these toe snapping noises and when they did the snapping of their toe on the wooden surfaces it would amplify and kind of make like a weird i guess spectral type noise like otherly noise and so this trick started on april's Fool's eve the girls would just drop apples that were attached to strings on the floor to prank their mom and it eventually just evolved to where they became tricking the whole town so Leah was fearful that if the truth came out, her family would get a lot of backlash and she was worried about all that. And she also realized that Maggie and Kate had a talent that they could make money off of. She saw these pamphlets and realized like this dude is making money off my sisters and look at all these people that they have just coming to the house to look at this knocking like I could make money off of this. And so she kind of had this entrepreneurial spirit about her. 
So Leah decided, you know what, mom and dad, you're so stressed out about all this ghost stuff. The girls shouldn't be living this lifestyle. I'll take them off your hands. I'm going to take Maggie and Kate back to meet a Rochester and I'll take care of them. And so the parents let her take the kids and she decided to act as their manager, like a medium manager, basically. And Maggie and Katie even tried to teach Leah how to do the snapping, but that she could never figure it out or do it the same. So they ended up being the main mediums of this group grooming the younger sisters to hold these seances and they ended up doing for one dollar you could attend the seance and it became an instant hit they landed gig after gig and they kind of kept growing and growing they landed this one gig with a man named isaac with his wife amy post and they were really impressed with the seance and they were a family that was a little more wealthy so it was kind of a big deal to be entertaining them And so Leah Fox had proved to be a medium communicating with their deceased daughter. And they were really touched by that to be able to talk to their deceased child. And so the posts just thought this was amazing. And there was a lot of potential here. And they rented the largest hall in Rochester. And 400 people came to attend a seance with the Fox sisters. And it was a pretty big successful thing. But there was, you know, some skeptics. And it got a little heated when the skeptics wanted proof that this wasn't fake. Um, So somehow this was a thing, a regular thing that began happening to many, many women eventually. But the sisters got taken to a private chamber and were asked to disrobe and were examined by a committee of skeptics, men, um, to try to find something like a device that was the hoax. And... Hearing that it really, really made me think about the witch trials. This was the last time my research took me to a situation where young girls were expected to strip down naked to be examined for a witch's mark, which are a witch's teat or the devil's teat, you know, to show that they were doing witchcraft. And it just sounds like a lot of bullshit and like men using their power over women and making them strip down and like to see their naked bodies. I'm like, what are you trying to prove here? Like, this is just messed up. Like, No, (laughs) I don't think you need to make people take off their clothes to prove that that it's a hoax or not. So it really makes me mad. Makes me even think about like today, how women in Hollywood are subjected to weird shit and and the modeling industry and how like to this day, men in power are still disrobing women kind of just to like, I think, display their power over them. Yeah. So basically, I was just thinking, I was like, why, why were they doing this? How, how would it solve anything to make them take their clothes off yeah like they were kind of on the money they were hoaxing but their right. naked body is not gonna not reveal to, it yeah that was not the way to go around it and they were minors at the time 12 and too. 14 i believe yeah that's ridiculous it is it's like oh they're in power they're getting 400 people to look at them and and believe this like let's bring those women in power down you know mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. really really irritating yeah it's <sighs> not right but despite those hardships maggie kate and leah fox embarked on this professional tour to spread word of the spirits and they conducted their sessions inviting as many as 30 attendees to gather around a large table and they would even do private meetings as well and most who came to see them were really happy to believe that the fox sisters were the real deal and maggie in particular was subject to some terrifying abuse from those who thought her a fraud or a heretic Because I guess she was the one that was doing most of the talking, I guess. Mm. And so in Troy, New York, she was even the victim of an attempted kidnapping by a group of men who seemed really offended by the sister's show. And for Maggie and Kate, it was getting to be too much. This was just a childhood prank. You know, this was just to like tease their mom. (laughs) And it really grew and grew and grew out of hand. On November 1849, they tried to foreshadow their demise in a seance spelling out we will now bid you farewell. They did this by tapping their toe joints during a seance, you know, to get the letters. And so for weeks, the spirits remained silent and they would say, oh, nothing's coming up in a seance and they stopped snapping. But Leah was taking them aside and pushing them and forced them to continue on. And in 1850, rapping, as they called it, had spread everywhere nationwide. All these mediums were coming forward and decided they could do these seances too. And there was a great need for it. 
This even spread to Great Britain. Kate played a significant part in that by going over there and doing these stage shows where ghosts and apparitions were said to appear in this strange psychic light during her seances. And no one's quite sure what she was doing or what that light was like. I, In my mind, I was like, maybe she was using like reflective surfaces like a mirror to get light. But I don't know. But mm. people were really intrigued by these like parlor tricks. And this really reframed the mainstream view of paranormal, and it kind of brought celebrity-like status to these mediums. They were like showmans. And so spiritualism was this huge phenomenon by 1850, and the mediums, like I said, were just coming out of the woodwork, and seances were just part of like this fashionable, popular activity. And many of these new mediums were even more showy than the Fox sisters. They would have trance mediums who would channel spirits and produce even ectoplasm and all kinds of these weird like effects. I heard that the ectoplasm would be like cheesecloth or like a lamb's liver and just like weird stuff. They would have levitation tricks. They would even use instruments. One person had a a fishing wire tied to a violin and so they would like pull it under the table so that it looked like it was playing itself and they would have like trumpets being used as the voice of spirits so a lot of like i would say almost like sleight of hand magicianship kind of coming into play Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um they would say oh if the bell rings it's the ghost and so they'd have like a bell on the table but be ringing a bell under the table potentially or like an assistant Mm -hmm. would ring the bell and so Mm -hmm. there was a lot of trickery going on Um, Who's to say that not all of these seance were doing that, but a a lot of them were. I read that even some were using like these floating balloons and being with a face drawn on it. And they'd be like, there's a ghost. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm just shocked. I'm like, wow, you guys are really entertained in 1850, like easily. Right. (laughs) And that's why seances are typically held in the dark so that they can get all of this sleight of hand stuff and, and really amaze the crowds. But the Vox sisters were really only doing rapping at the time. Others were doing more elaborate things, like even using trap doors that people in costume would pop out of and, and pretend to be a ghost, which sounds like honestly really entertaining. Right. But in the years that they conducted their seances, there was some evidence of fraud. So a lot of times they would bring like Benjamin Franklin out in their seances and he would speak to the groups. But people would notice that like Ben's grammar was really off. <laughs> you're like i don't think he sounds as smart as he used to and then under some conditions the girls just couldn't snap like at one performance there were cushions placed between the girls feet and these wooden floorboards and so leah would kind of step up and be like the negative energy of the cynics pollute the channels between the girls and the spirits and she would say that only the peer of heart who believed without question would be able to witness definitive proof of the girl's power so they had ways of trying to like navigate that of course Um, Mm -hmm. several people even realized that the rapping was caused by them and their cracking toes. A physician, several priests, and three university professors all had articles published in newspaper putting them, like, forward as frauds. But this was really all ignored by the main public. They kept going on for years after that. It's kind of funny, like, I keep thinking they're going to have these really arthritic toes when they get older. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) All the snapping. (laughs) I know, it's weird. Like, I cannot move my toes, do any kind of thing. Like, right. it's weird. Um, but eventually, through all these hardships, the girls kind of split and go their own ways. The younger, exploited sisters, Kate and Maggie, faced a lot of hardships, and alcoholism became a thing. And Leah was really capitalizing on this fame, and her status went up. Like, she was just a single mom before who couldn't afford really much to having all this wealth and social clout and all these opportunities that were never available to her before. She rose in society ranks and became a wife of a Wall Street banker. Um, His name was Daniel Underhill. And this marriage was in 1857. Daniel was also a spiritualist. So the pair of them kind of became the control of the movement. While Kate had been left to be brought up by this man, Horace Greeley. Um, He was a founder and editor of the New York Tribune and a devoted spiritualist. And so she attended a private school in New York. And when she was old enough to get out of the house, she went back to the stage as a medium. And her act had developed from just wrappings to a full production of the different kind of stage mediums of the day, doing the manifestations of spirits and channeling the dead. And she was noted for her ability to receive one message through automatic writing while simultaneously giving voices to another. And she was a really 
big, true celebrity medium. And she took advantage of her celebrity status, also kind of overindulging, like I mentioned, and this is when that drinking problem happened. She eventually married um, a spiritualist and gave birth to two children, and her husband died in 1881, while Maggie had begun to feel really burdened by all of her lies because she fell in love with a man, Elijah Kane. He was a famous Arctic ex- explorer and kind of a skeptic. Um, he attended these Philadelphia seances trying to expose them, but he actually never could. And so Kane fell in love with her and he promised Maggie that he would be married to her one day. And for years, she clung to this idea of that marrying and leaving this whole spiritualist sideshow movement behind. But there was some pushback from his family who didn't think that this was a good match, that this woman was like um, evil for doing these things. So he gave her like a promise ring and did like this ring exchanging ceremony before one of his expeditions. And he was like, look, I know my family is not happy about it, but when I get back, we're going to get married. We're going to do a full wedding and everything. But he fell ill during his travels and died in Cuba at the age of 36. Oh, how sad. It is. And Elijah's parents forbade her from attending the funeral. They refused to acknowledge her as their son's betrothed and common-law wife and rejected any claim she had to the share of his estate. So she lost a lot. Um, She retaliated by publishing this book called The Love Life of Dr. Kane, a book of his love letters to her. And she had a lot of heartache and self-contempt for the lies And this movement just gave her opportunities, but also was taking them away because people didn't like her, think that she was good enough because she was evil, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So she turned to alcohol. And in 1864, Leah found out how serious her sister's drinking problem was and arranged for them to go to rehab. And their father died in early 1865. And then their mothers died the next year. So it kind of stopped them from ever attending rehab. There was just so much stuff in the family going on. They never went. From then, Leah had added pressure to make more money and to keep those girls in line. She would try to keep them to do the seances and just wanted them to band together, basically, and get more money. But again, Maggie was really pushing back. So at the New York Academy of Music on October 21st, 1888, Maggie booked this whole stage thing to expose herself and her sisters and spiritualism and she decided to demonstrate her little snapping toes she literally got a stool took off her shoes and was snapping her toe to the audience and being like this is how we did it spiritualism is a lie and she said that my sister katie and myself were very young children when this horrible deception began a great many people when they hear the rapping imagine at once that the spirits are touching them she explained and it is a very common delusion Some very wealthy people come to see me some years ago when I lived in the 42nd Street, and I did some rappings for them. I made the spirit rap on the chair, and one of the ladies cried out, I feel the spirit tapping on my shoulder. And of course, that was pure imagination. And so she did her demonstration, and Maggie insisted that her sister Leah knew that the rappings were fake all along, and that she was greedily exploiting her younger sisters. And then she exited the stage, but before she did that, she thanked God that she was able to expose spiritualism. And Kate, now a widow with a drinking problem, was sitting in the audience, confirmed everything that Maggie said. These two sisters had just had enough. And Leah dismissed her sisters as attention seekers, and Maggie had been saying that Maggie had been paid $1,500 for the performance. And so the papers declared that the demonstration was a death blow to spiritualism. But ironically, the movement really proved to be unstoppable. Like it was such, it was beyond them. There were so many people involved, so many believers with all these personal experiences that they didn't care that they were fakes or claimed to be fakes. They kind of bought into the fact that they were just drunks who were being paid, who wanted the money to say that and were fighting with their sisters. In 1890, Leah was in her late seventies. She passed away. And the year before she had managed to pressure Maggie into recanting her confession. So Maggie recanted her confession and everything she had said, even though there is actually a book that she published about how this is all fake. You can read it for free on Google books She goes into great detail with a lot of religious remorse, saying that this was all fake. And then Kate died in 1892 of kidney disease, and Maggie died the following year of a heart attack. So Maggie was a pauper at the time of her death. But thanks to the donations from friends, Mm. she was burned next to her sister in Cypress Hill in Brooklyn. 
and there's a monument to the spiritualism and to them in front of their old cottage. And there's even this Masonic monument in New York because they had such a big impact and brought spiritualism to be a common thing. And that's pretty much the Fox sisters, the rise and demise. It's crazy. I'd never really heard their story before. So that's all really interesting. I thought so. Um, I, like I said, going in was really hoping for a genuine medium story and love and sisterhood. But what I got was just kind of sad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very. <laughs> but there are a lot oh. of highs and lows. I mean, I'm really su- summarizing their life and times. So I just think with the Fox sisters, I think I was disappointed to find out that it was faked. I didn't know anything about about them really so and then then I find out that they're just these fakes I don't think the whole spiritualism movement was fake no per se I think that there were some other things that came out of it and and I've got some good examples with the people that I'm going to talk about but good awesome um so I don't know what was your whole take on them do you uh, their story was just sad to me it is sad it's melancholy to think that they had a lot of um opportunity they did a lot for themselves they took themselves at a little farmhouse Mm -hmm. and had a lot more greatness but it had a lot of tragedy and a cost and it seemed to weigh heavily on them that they were doing something that maybe in their minds god didn't see fit or or for whatever reason And you want, like, paranormal stuff to be real. You know, there's so many hoaxers in the conspiracy theories, in ghosts, in cryptozoology, like people who claim to have Bigfoot in an ice chest on coast to coast, and turns out, no, they don't. So Right. It's just deer hair. (laughs) Yep. So do you want to share to us, who did you research? Okay, so the first person I'm going to talk about is William H. Mumbler. And this is a very interesting case. I found it to be very interesting. So he was from Boston. Um, He was a copper plate engraver and a printing operator. So basically what that meant was he took, he engraved jewelry and he engraved copper plates. So for whatever they may need, maybe that means that it's for anything because a lot of times they use copper plates for design and stuff. Mm-hmm. And ultimately he was also an inventor. So I'll kind of talk about that a little bit later, but in 1861, he taught himself, he was teaching himself the art of taking photos, which um, was for him to impress this girl that he met. So he, where he worked at as an engraver was on this specific street and her office that she worked at as a photographer was just a few doors down from him. And so like he saw her while he was out having lunch one day mm. and um, her, he, he just was smitten by her. He was like, Oh my gosh, this girl is beautiful. I need to find out everything about her. And her name was Hannah Green Stewart. And she would later become his wife, but pretty much the beginning part of the story is him trying to, to get her to like him. And I know, right. So her profession, even though she was a photographer, she also was a mesmeric physician, which was really interesting to me. What that means is she was a healing medium and she would offer medium services to people on the side other than just taking photos. So um, she would, yeah, right. So she would take their picture and then they'd be like, Hey, could you talk to my loved one? And then eventually she also started offering these physician services. So for an added fee, she would diagnose their illnesses. So she said that her psychic ability allowed her to contact this doctor who had passed away named Benjamin Rush and that he would give her the information to tell them what was wrong with them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, one Mr. Mumler, William H. Mumler, when he found out about all of this about her, he was extremely skeptic. Like he didn't believe in the Fox sisters stuff. He didn't believe in anything, anybody having gifts whatsoever. So he was a huge skeptic. But she agreed to help him learn how to take photos. And so one day she was teaching him how to set up the camera and he set it up and he was setting up the room 
because you know usually they used to when you would sit for a photo they were there would be this whole process going on so they'd set up the whole room so he set up the table and he accidentally took the photo of himself next to a chair huh. and when he developed the photo there was a ghost sitting in the chair that was next to him oh is this photo online yes yeah oh my and gosh. It showed this ghostly girl, which he said looked exactly like his cousin who had died like 12 years before. Mm -hmm. So he was like, wait, there must have been something that I did wrong. Did I use old equipment? He was like extremely skeptic. He thought that he made a huge mistake and he was really embarrassed. He was like, he was like, what happened? Why did this happen? I'm a horrible photographer. I'm making a fool of myself in front of this beautiful woman that I want to date me. Oh, and like he just felt really bad. And somehow and I think this is this this goes to show this woman that he married. She was not the greatest woman. She was really into making a profit. Um, So she was like Leah. (laughs) <laughs> right. So I think that she contacted a New York newspaper and they came down and saw the photo and ran a newspaper article on on this picture. Gotcha. So I'm trying to Google the picture. I'm very, very fascinated by this. Is it the w- yes. one where he's just sitting there and there's like a little shadow figure kind of by him? Um, There were many photos, right. so I'm not sure. Yeah, there were literally hundreds of photos that you could come across. I'm curious. Um, I'm like, is this just double exposure? That's what he thought mm-hmm. it was. Mm-hmm. But then it kept happening. So huh. um, soon after that newspaper article ran, people started coming to see him because they thought, well, if he can take a picture of a, of a spirit with him, maybe he could take a picture of with us. And so he started taking these pictures, but... At that time, they considered this to be a black art. Mm. So they were like, okay, there there were friends of his who were like, ooh, you're dabbling in the black arts. You really shouldn't be doing this. Yeah. That fear and judgment always coming up. Right. And that skepticism that he had anyways to begin with. Mm -hmm. But people would start coming to him and he would take the photos and each time a spirit would show up in them. Well, he decided to take his photos that he'd taken that he probably at this point had a dozen or so and he went to an a famous photographer that was in the same area as him named james wallace black and he looked at them and he couldn't debunk them he didn't know why it happened and why it kept happening and so mumler was like i'm embarrassed i feel like i'm doing something wrong maybe you could just do this process with me and so james wallace black said fine, I'm going to sit for a photo for you and I'll watch you do the whole process. And so he, uh, Mr. Mundler took Black, Mr. Black's photo using Mr. Black's equipment. So he knew that he was using all brand, you know, all equipment that he wasn't really accustomed to. He took the photo and then Mr. Black went with him and watched his every move, like how he set up the camera, how he took the photo itself, then how he processed the photo after it was done so that it would go into a negative. And when they were at the negative process, uh, Mr. Black said, here, let me take a look at that. And he noticed that there was a ghostly figure of his son who had died a few years what? prior to that. Are you serious? Yeah. Yes. And Mr. Black was like, whoa, what the heck? I've been with you through this whole process. There's no possible way that you could have faked this. Right. So he didn't know how it happened. So after a while went by, um, Mr. Mumbler claimed that the ghost would come around because his wife was near him. Mm. And that she acted as a spiritual battery. So it would kind of like maybe she put off this electricity so spirits would appear around him. Gotcha. So that's what he started thinking. But he was so skeptic, he still didn't know. And so initially, he didn't even charge anybody for these pictures. So people would come. He'd let them be involved in the whole process so he could see that. So they could see that he wasn't faking them. And he still couldn't believe that it was happening. He still kept thinking there's something that I'm doing wrong. 
other photographers came his way to watch the whole process. People sat for him. So there are a lot of pictures out there that you'll find where it's of Mr. Mumler taking photos of other famous photographers of the time period. And no one knew, no one knew what was causing it. And then in 1869, he started offering his services up to the wealthy. And this is when he started charging for his photographs. Um, It should be kind of noted that a typical photo, he would charge somebody 25 cents and they would get like 12 photos. Nice, nice. For these. Nice rates. Right. (laughs) Yes. But then for these ghostly photos, he would charge 10 bucks for one photo. So he upcharged them. Right. And then um, there is a photo too that he took. I should side note that one of his most famous photos was after Lincoln died. He took a picture of Mary Todd and Lincoln was in the background. That's one of the most famous ones. Like if you can see uh, Mary Todd with Lincoln's ghost, you can Google search that one. I am looking at that one. Wiki is trying to say that that one was later um, exposed as 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 a fake as a fake yeah because i thought initially when i was studying um that she came and sat and posed for him but really what she did was this thing that he started offering later on this mail process so um what he would do this was in this was because his wife at the time that that wife of his hannah she wanted him to start offering his services via the mail get more clients and she said that Right, to get more clients. Mm -hmm. So the ad in the paper said, just send in the information about your departed loved one and we'll send you a picture back. Mm -hmm. And if you give us $7.50, you're going to get this picture in about three weeks. And so that's where that picture came from, that Mary Todd sent in information that she wanted a picture of her husband, Lincoln, who passed away. Obviously, everybody probably had access to photos of them. Mm Mm-hmm. And it was said that the photo that he used was one that had been printed in the paper of Lincoln dying. Now, the thing is, I can't say that Mumler actually did that. I actually think Hannah was the one responsible for those. So the pictures that Mumler took, he actually seemed to have taken photos of ghosts. So you're kind of somewhere Um, in the gray area with, with him? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think that there was some fraud going on, but I think that that was when they started doing the mail service. And I think that there were some tricks that Hannah played on Mr. Mumler. I found out that he also had been in contact with P.T. Barnum. And, you know, Barnum was a, was a hoaxer, like yes. through and through. yes. But he was really excited about Mumler's photos and actually put them in this museum that he had. And there was, it was called the American Museum. Mm -hmm. Well, Barnum didn't like some of the, some of the pictures that he had received. And also it was causing some fight with him and some other rich dude. And there was some sort of fire that happened at the museum and people think that P.T. Barnum started it. Oh. Yeah. And so all of Mumler's pictures that he took that were in P.T. Barnum's museum (gasps) were destroyed. Horrible. His original photos. So where do we get these now? So the ones that we have now are some of the ones that that were given to clients that that he didn't get to keep. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of times he would go and use their equipment. So you got to think about that. Like if if you're going and sitting at his studio, I could see where people would think, okay, he is definitely faking this. He's he's using his own equipment. He's doing this double exposure. But if he's going there and using their equipment and using all of everything from the beginning to the end of their supplies – how could he fake that? Yeah. So in comes this one man in April of 1869, a man named P.V. Hickey. He was a journalist and a very devout Catholic. He sat for a photo of with Mumbler. So actually Mumbler went to where he was at, I think in New York or in one of the larger cities. He went to one of the larger cities mm. and he sat for Hickey sat for him and, and he immediately a spirit came back in the photo and it was of somebody he didn't know. 
And he was looking at the photo and he was like, you know what? This is a threat to the church and this guy is a swindler. And so he decided to write a scathing article against Mr. Mumbler. And then he went and filed a formal complaint against him at City Hall. And so <laughs> Mumbler was then hunted down and arrested on two counts, felony oh. counts of fraud and larceny. Dang. Said to have cheated people out of lots and lots of money during this difficult time when people were you know, dying with death from yellow fever and all that rampant war yeah. that was happening in the United States. And plus he said they, he was swindling people because he was taking advantage of not only what had happened to them, but the fact that he was charging them so much money. Right. So the whole thing online, like I am super glad that I read different reports because I read the wiki on this. I read a couple of books on him, but there are, there were such detailed things about the trial mm, that I was lucky awesome. enough to get the information. Yeah. So there were a lot of, there was a lot of back and forth. So at the trial, Mumler claimed that he was innocent and he said that, you know what? I am not a con artist. You say what you want. There's a sea of con artists and hoaxers out there because of the spiritualism movement, but I am not one of them. And he said, it's just that I came across this new type of technology that nobody knows about. He's like, just because you don't know about this new technology doesn't mean it's a bad thing. You know, it's something different. And so while he was on, tr on trial, one of the things that he said was the history of all pioneers of new truths is relatively the same. And happy is the man who is not the chosen one to meet the prejudices of a skeptical world and the development of some new discovery. So he's just like, dudes, I made this new thing. And yes, we live in a very skeptic world, but I'm telling you that this is truth. Hmm. And the prosecutors said that anyone who had a belief in the supernatural should be considered to be a heretic. So they were performing heresy. Any of these believers are delusional and should be locked up for being crazy. Yeah. Can you believe that they said that? I was kind of angry. I was like, just because we believe in the paranormal doesn't mean we should be locked up. I mean, we're um, talking about the 1800s. I can believe that. Right. That's true. It's like That's true. 200 years prior, there was the witch trials in Massachusetts. Right. right. So, yeah, I can believe that. Right. So they just felt that Mumler was a man who was conning people and really what it was about was he was bringing up some, they felt like he was religiously attacking them for sure on. Yeah. And so this was a different idea and a different type of movement. And so they, they just felt like their Catholicism was being attacked. I just kind of got angry at that. Cause I was like, really the Catholics have murdered so many people throughout the years. And now they're just upset because some guy's taking photos of the dead people. Yeah, I never really thought about it. Like, I guess religion, like Christianity or Quakers, whatever was going on there, Catholicism, mm -hmm. like, did they just not say anything about ghosts in religious texts? Uh, they do. They talk about it. And that's actually in, in my study, I found that... Mumler's attorney was like, look, here are all these cases. Like he started quoting scripture in the courtroom and he was like talking about how this person saw something paranormal. This person saw a ghost. This person saw Jesus come back from the dead. So Ooh, you're telling me that paranormal stuff? Yeah. yeah. So he's like, you're telling me that paranormal stuff doesn't happen? Right. My, this is in the scripture. Yeah. Take a look at the Bible. That so, thing is filled with some weird stuff. Exactly. So he was just basically calling out the non-believers in the courtroom saying, look, it exists. It exists. And then the attorney, uh, Mr. Mumler's attorney, made sure that everyone knew that Mumler was just taking and taking these photos and developing these photos. These spirits showed up just like other invisible energies. It's stuff we didn't know about. And he even brought up the fact that recently somebody had come up with Morse code. He's like, nobody thought that guy was crazy when he said that he could send some sort of signal from here all the way across to another country. Nobody thought he was crazy. So why would we think this new technology is crazy? That's interesting. Like Morse code was brought up a lot when they were talking about spiritual wrappings. Like, oh, you right. think that those kind of little dots and dashes noises are bullshit or ours are bullshit, but not theirs. Like, Right. They considered the Fox sisters 
doing the Morris code of spiritualism kind of thing. Right. So I guess this right. like age of technology was also just pushing boundaries of limitations and pushing a box of what people were thinking about and what was possible. And Absolutely. I really like this. I like that people are thinking outside the box. Yeah, yeah. I found out that there were tons and tons of witnesses. So pretty much anybody who had a photo taken, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of people came and as witnesses for this trial. So it lasted weeks because they had to have all of this, these questions answered. And um, the prosecutors, they wanted to have the photos examined and then they also came up with this thing saying, OK, look, we take took our own fake photos. Look, we can do it, too. Anybody can do this. Anybody can do it. Yeah. And the judge, he kind of had a soft spot for Mumbler. So he was like, I'm really curious and interested about what this guy does. He's like, you guys, I'm going to get my own team to have them watch his process and and see if they can see if there's anything going on that's potentially fraudulent and they actually couldn't find anything that he was doing that was different than any other person who took a photo. Um, and because of that, the judge, his name was Joseph Dowling. He said, look, anyone out there who thinks that these are fraud, I've had these other teams look at them it can't be debunked, so therefore he's not guilty. So he was found not guilty at the trial. Good for him. I did, right? I did find it interesting that the one thing that everybody said is that Hannah, his wife, helped him on many occasions set up the equipment. And she always touched the camera in one specific spot. Interesting. It was like the right-hand corner of the camera. And so I didn't know if that meant she was adding something to the camera, but nobody could see anything on the lens because it was always near the lens, but nobody could see anything on the lens. Yeah. So was she calling forth spirits by touching it? Was she enchanting the camera hmm. in some way? After, um, after the trial, it was kind of unfortunate, but Mrs. Mumler, she left him and she moved to a different um, state and she opened up a new business. She stayed married to him, but she didn't, um, she didn't live with him anymore because he was no longer bringing in money. Nobody would really want to come and sit with him because everybody was so suspicious and judgmental about what he, about the validity of his photos because of this trial. Then he died in 1852, kind of at a very young age. And his obituary listed him as the inventor of the photoelectrotype company. And also just as an inventor, to, he did all of these other things. But the photoelectrotype company was basically what came up with the spirit photography. That's basically what that was. And so he was an inventor and had a patent on that. Mm. So I found that to be kind of interesting that they did let him patent that. That is interesting. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. kind of on the fence. Like, I, I'm leaning more towards skeptic in this case. I mm -hmm. just don't see mm -hmm. how... I believe in ghosts, yes, but I don't believe in the predictability of ghosts. Like, all the ghost right. hunting shows I've watched, it's kind of just random. So I don't feel like right. he could have the ability, or, or Hannah, the ability to capture something every time guaranteed. Mm -hmm. I really think... I'm going to say double exposure is what I think they're doing. And maybe... I don't know exactly how that would work on a Victorian camera. I think it's just something like you have to take two photos, but on one, like for one picture and they overlap. So maybe she was the one doing it, but maybe, I don't know. Potentially. I even thought maybe she had some little weird, strange cutout photo, like maybe on gauzy material that she somehow stuck to the camera that was naked to the invisible eye. So if she knew who was sitting for the picture, that she would put it on there. I don't think he was aware. I don't think Mumler was aware of what was going on. I think that he may have been innocent in the whole thing. Right. And we're, this is speculation on both of our ends, of course. Right. Right. Of course. And I just have to say, like, has was he ever strip searched? Um, no, he was not. Yeah. Interesting, right? Yep. How had it been his wife? Sure, they probably would yeah. have done that to her. It's like, show us your but dick. Because he was a man. Yeah. <laughs> what are you hiding? He was a man, so nobody, yeah, mm -hmm. nobody did that. Mm -hmm. Not that they would have found yeah. anything, but I'm just kind of wondering if that ever did happen to men. Yeah, I don't know. I'm guessing not. Yeah. 
men had just by being male, they had a higher stature in life at the time. Yeah. Higher status, I guess, not stature. That's height. <laughs> probably <laughs> status. Too, though, probably. <laughs> yeah, they're there. <laughs> Either way. Yeah. So interesting story. Definitely. So then I came across these sisters. I too have found some sisters. They're called the Bangs sisters. Uh the first one is May, and she was born in 1862, and her sister Elizabeth, who they called Lizzie, she was born in 1859, and they were born in Kansas. But shortly after being born, they moved to Chicago, and their mother actually started teaching them mediumship at a young age because she was also a medium and born a medium. That sounds so adorable, like toddlers in tiara, but with mediums. Right, Exactly. <laughs> And then in 1874, when they were smack dab in that hormone changing time of their lives, they made contact with a poltergeist and their whole, they started having this poltergeist activity in the house. And this is where their communication with spirits started and their abilities were wide ranging. So they practiced clairvoyance and they had clear audience. They did automatic writing, slate writing, and even communication by typewriter. And messages appeared on the machines with no apparent human intervention, which I know a lot of that stuff could be faked. I'm not sure in their situation that it was that way because I believe that they were born with these abilities um, based on the stories that I read from things that happened when they were even younger. Mm -hmm. um, but at any rate, they started to have a career right after that time that they spoke with the poltergeist and they started holding seances. So they too were young children at the time that they were having seances. And in the beginning, it was that they would take a slate. You know what a slate is, right? It's just like a little blackboard, but it's one of those small handheld ones. Yes. Only, I'm thinking about like... Um, little women, like how they would use them. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And so they would set the slate up in a nearby chair. No chalk was nearby. And then writing would just somehow appear on the slate as they were having the seance. And a lot of times while they were having a seance, furniture would move on its own. Even one time, the mother had the sisters go into a cabinet and locked in there. And the sisters had their hands tied behind them while they were locked in this cabinet. And when they came out, they had a little baby kitten in their hands. <laughs> that definitely sounds like a magic trick. Right. That it was said to come from the other side. I thought it was hilarious. Right? I was like, okay, that's probably fake. Yeah. Their that's kind probably... of like wrap it out of the hat, kind of a sleight of right, hand. Right. Right. And then in 1881, so I'm trying to think how old they would have been in their early 20s. So in 1881, one of the sisters and the mother were arrested for doing business without a license. Not for being someone who did seances, but because they were holding seances as a business and they didn't have a license for that. Interesting. I never thought about how right. they have to have some sort of business license to be doing this. Exactly. I guess that makes sense. Right. And so they were in jail for a very short amount of time released and then they kept doing their business. And then in 1888, they were the sisters were arrested for making too much money what? for talking to ghosts. So because they had a lucrative business, they made too much money as women unmarried. And so because of this, they were arrested. This is angering me so much. <laughs> right. Right. Ugh. And then it gets even worse because in 1890 in Chicago, a bill was written because of them. And the bill brought into law something that would ban anyone from spirit mediumship and taking on a spirit during a seance. So if you were caught, you would be fined and imprisoned. So this is in Chicago only? Only in Chicago. Okay. So they had a tougher being there. Right. So the sisters left Chicago at that time. They would return later and actually die in Chicago later on. Mm -hmm. But at this time, they decided to move all over and travel. And one of the places they landed was a place called Lilydale, New York, which I kind of talked to you. I messaged you about. Did you have a chance to look that place up? I did. Yes. I saw some it's, things. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. So a bunch of currently it's filled with mediums and they even have this museum there. Uh, and Center for Religious Spiritualism, where you can take classes. 
what is really cool is the museum houses some of the sisters work in there because this is what I'm going to talk about next is they were famous for doing these paintings, mm. uh, spirit paintings. And these are very interesting. If you end up looking up their name with spirit paintings behind it, you're going to find some really cool stuff. Okay. So I love it. <laughs> <laughs> the sisters started doing these precipitated spirit paintings. I don't know exactly what that means. I should have worked, looked up the word precipitated. Well, that's just like with, like, a, like a glass of water, how it has like the precipitation on the outside. Right. So I, they just appeared before people's eyes. Okay. So this is a painting that's done at a seance by an unseen force. So let's say they would be contacted. This is how I read it, is that the sisters would be contacted by someone who wanted to do a seance and they said we want to do a spirit portrait and the sisters would say okay could you bring two framed canvases and i'm not talking about ones in an actual frame but you know with that wooden thing in the back so it's not just the canvas mm -hmm. and the seance goers would come to the house and the sisters would take the canvases and they would set them either side by side or face by face but always in front of a window where light could go through the canvas and they said without the light the picture would not come so they whether it was moonlight or sunlight it didn't matter mm. they would set these in front of the window and they would begin the seance and as the seance was going on a picture would appear on the canvas of who the seance was about so it was all done brushless with pastels there were there would be extreme detail and sometimes the patrons would look at the photo and be like, okay, well, this is how I remember them. This seems to be missing from the photo. The person would take the picture home and sometime in the night while they were staring at it, the thing that was originally missing from the photo would just suddenly appear on the portrait mm -hmm. in front of the people's eyes. That would be a When trip. the sisters were not even around. Yeah, that's a pretty good service. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's like... I'm trying to figure out how you could fake that if it's not even in front of the sisters when they're there. So they would do these seances with sometimes just one person in the room, sometimes two people. Occasionally they do them kind of like at these big fairs where hundreds of people will come at a time and watch them do these paintings. You know, the skeptics, they're there. <laughs> they wanted to say, okay, what if the sisters somehow previously painted the picture and then somehow switched it out during the process yeah they said that some it may be possible that they pre-drew the canvas the night before and somehow putting into the light made the paint appear onto the board somehow uh -huh. potentially with some sort of wire system since there were no brushes involved so I, I'm trying to figure out how they could do a detailed painting with wires. It's got to be some sort of trick with like, like making almost like a light box. Maybe. Um, another thing that they said, some believe that the sisters would clairvoyantly see the photo. Um, so basically, I should have said this before. A lot of times when people would come to seances, this isn't just with these sisters, with anybody, they would carry a picture of their loved one, either in their purse or in their pocket they would never show it to the to the person that was giving the seance they would never show it to the sisters and so some people thought that there was a potential that the sisters were clairvoyant mm -hmm. and they could see the picture that was in the pocket and so because they could see this they were able to paint the photo f using this sort of mediumship but paint the photo magically somehow Right. Interesting. I'm, I wonder, they must have been mm -hmm. the first ones to do, do that technique. Yes, they were. And they were said to have done thousands and thousands of paintings. Um, it's, a lot of them have gone missing, but there are museums all over the world who house paintings of theirs. And more for the fact than, than anything, not because it's a spirit, but because the detail of the photos and the long lasting pictures and the lifeless or not lifeless but the life that was in these photos was just so amazing that the art itself was amazing and a lot of times these photos would be done within 15 to 60 minutes so to be able to create this great amount of art in such a short amount of time was pretty cool 
Right. Um, yeah. I mean, even if it is like a magician's trick, it's still a cool trick. Right. Right. A lot of people tried to debunk it, but nobody could ever debunk what happened. Um, I did find it interesting. This was kind of my favorite part. I don't know why, but they were born three years apart and they died three years apart. Oh, that's creepy. Mm hmm. Yeah. So that was kind of all I had about them. I just thought they were, their story was cute. So what do you think about them? Do you think that's real, like somehow spectral paintings or are you going to say fraud? Um, I think it's real. There was one thing I forgot to say. Um, and this is why I think it's real because sometimes when they would do the portraits, it was of a spirit that was that the person was not even trying to contact. So they'd have a seance and the picture would be of somebody completely different. That's just when they didn't have their shit together. And they're like, oh, shit, that's Bob. He's not here till Thursday. No, <laughs> I think that I think it was because what because I work with spirits, it's easy for me to say, duh, how can I contact that spirit when this spirit who's being so noisy and wants to be heard is the only spirit that wants to be there. I think the spirits were doing the paintings, not the sisters. Mm -hmm. It's just weird because like ghosts don't do that stuff nowadays. You know what I mean? That we know of. I guess. I'm just, I'm skeptic. <laughs> I'm like, there's a trick. But this is why people don't show this stuff no. because there are so many skeptic people. If you have to have why something would... with special conditions with the light, I think you're doing like something. I think they're doing some trickery. I guess. Yeah, I mean, if they're I doing stuff, could. they're doing box tricks, like making a cat appear in a box. That's trickery. Like mm -hmm. they were mm -hmm. groomed as sleight of hand women from their whole birth. Like. From birth, yeah. yeah. This... I still think that they were clairvoyant. I believe that they had some clairvoyancy going I on. I won't deny them that. <laughs> that I come down <laughs> with, yeah. It's yeah. when they, the parlor tricks yeah. come into play. It's like, I want, I'm want. i trying to figure out if the internet could debunk it, so I'm going to look into that, and I'll try to figure it out later. Right. <laughs> Do seriously look at their paintings, though, because they were detailed paintings that were pretty amazing. And I think that on its own, if they were doing some sleight of hand and using some wire system, that the fact that they were yeah, able to that's an illusionist. do this amazing art. Yeah, I love magicians. <laughs> I love sleight of hand. Yeah. So, I mean, like, same. that's still cool. Yeah, still cool. So, a lot of interesting ways that creative people could make a living for themselves. Absolutely. And I think that they didn't make a ton of money. Uh, just like, okay. yeah, that was the other thing is that they didn't charge a lot for their paintings. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times they would do them for free. Oh. So really, once they moved out of their parents' house, it wasn't about money. I wonder if that was from all the legal issues they had. Maybe. Paranormal stuff is so personal and minute and hard to, to define. And who's to say they didn't have some spiritual stuff going on? Right. Love the idea of the paranormal, and I don't want it to all be faked. Like, how sad would I be if I were to die and I found out it was all fake? Like, no. And then you've had all these ghost experiences your entire life. I know. If you were there, I'd be like, Get you'd be a medium. Oh, yeah. I would be a medium. It's crazy because both you and I have had Ouija experiences, mm -hmm. and we know how difficult it is to contact someone through a Ouija board. So imagine what it is like to contact someone to have a seance. So there had to have been at least one real person during the spiritual movement that could actually do it. And I bet those people are not in the newspaper. You're probably right then, because they are very old devices. Mm -hmm. I just like the idea of the paranormal. And so I could see myself hitting the ground running in New York and just getting into all these seances. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I would have been like... <laughs> Some widow just going to every single one. Yeah. <laughs> Channeling as many people as I could. <laughs> there are some people today who recreate these seances. And I'd be so down to go knowing full well that it yeah. might be a mix of real and showmanship. I think that would be fun. Sure. Yeah, it would be a lot mm -hmm. of fun. And so maybe for some it was entertainment. Okay. And then obviously for other people, they felt like they contacted their loved ones. And that's super reassuring. Right. You know? Right. <sighs> Well, I'm excited to do part two, so we'll have to do, we're going to give some more information to you guys in that part two, which will come out next week. There was just so much to say about this movement, and we really hope you guys enjoyed this episode. 
Well, thank you guys for listening. So like we said, join us next Wednesday for part two. And in the meantime, you can always find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Cousins Coven. And you can check out our blog, CousinsCoven.home.blog, where you can always find witchy words of wisdom, spells, and our archive podcast episodes from season one. So if you need to catch up, go do that there. And send us your research ideas if you have any questions or fan mail, or even if you have a paranormal experience, we'd love to hear it and read it on air, CousinsCoven2 at gmail.com. So please like, subscribe, and share with all of your witchy and weirdo friends. And may you find happiness in your heart, love for yourself, and join each other. Blessings to all.